Good morning. Good morning, Rabbi Welcome to Breakfast in the Class. Breakfast in the Class today uh, is dedicated loving memory to Nishmatev Abraham ben Nazira, Albert Nisim, Alav Shalom, and Police Abad Rachel, Paul and Nisim, sponsored by Carol and Maurice Silver Rocha, and Rechem Began Eden. Also, in loving memory to Nishmat Yitzchak ben Selma and his first Askara. May we see him, Baruch Hashem, with the coming of the Mashiach, the building of the Beit HaMikdash Nunah, they sponsored by the Zakai family. Nishmato Eden, Bezat Hashem. Also, and the week of Kobru is sponsored by David E. Ash in honor of you and your substantial capacity to do today and every day. Please only answer Ahmed if you are here with us present. Okay, my friends, let us begin. So, there's a uh, concept in psychology called split personality disorder. And what is a split personality disorder? A person who manifests with more than one personality. Yeah? So sometimes a person will appear like this, and obviously it's an oversimplification, but sometimes the person will appear with one personality, a kind, congenial, nice, sweet, warm. Next thing you know, Dr. Jekyll... How you doing, Mr. Hyde? Okay? Classic split personality, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Okay? My friends, the Torah actually asks of us to have a split personality. Now, before you jump down my throat, of course, I don't mean that a person should have a mental, uh, psychological condition. And, of course, I'm not making light of the difficulty that someone who has such a condition uh, that they have in their life. I'm not saying. But I want to illustrate with such a, a sharp relief what I'm asking of you today on behalf of the Torah. And let me explain what I mean by that by way of a story. There's a guy who comes to his rabbi and he says, Rabbi, I have a problem. What's the problem? The rabbi says, he says, you know, I have a problem. I'm very arrogant. I have a big ego. It's causing me lots of trouble at home with my family and my work. And I can't control it. I can't control my arrogance, my gava. The rabbi says, that's a very big problem. It's a huge problem. And it's only going to get worse. He says, but it's such a big problem. I'm not sure I can deal with it properly right now. So he says, so go into the bed, can I sit? Sit by the bima. Okay? And I'll deal with you soon when I have a few minutes, when I have time. Our fellow, his name is Dave, he goes, he sits next to the bima, sits there like this. Two minutes later, this guy walks into the rabbi. He says, Rabbi, I need some help. What kind of help do you need? You don't know, I'm having all sorts of trouble. He says, with my finances, my finances are a mess. My taxes are you know, killing me. The government's going to take away my business. I don't know what to do. I'm in serious problem. The guy says, you came at just the right time. He says, really? He says, yes. There's a guy, Dave, he's sitting right at the synagogue. He's an expert at finance. This guy, whiz. You go, he's going to solve all your problems. The guy says, really? He says, yeah, no. Anyway, guy goes. He says, hello, my name is uh, Shlomo. Dave, he says, the rabbi sent me to you. He says, he sent you to me? He says, yeah. He says, he told me, that you're going to help me. I have a problem with my business. I have a problem with this. I have a problem with that. He goes, what do you want from me? He says, well, I'm having this tax issue, man. This problem. And he came to, he says, I'm not a tax expert. I'm not a finance guy. I don't know anything about economics. I don't know what you're talking about. The guy says, you don't know anything? He says, let's go to the rabbi. He go back to the rabbi. And the rabbi says, rabbi, you asked him to come see me? He says, yeah. He goes, I have no idea. I don't know how to help him. What do I know about taxes? What do I know about finances? The rabbi says, oh, Oh, you did, You don't know? Oh, I'm so sorry. I had no idea. I must have been making, making a mistake. I'm sorry. I'll get back to you in a few minutes. Okay. And then the guy leaves. The rabbi helps him out. Said, Two minutes later, another guy walks up to Dave. Says, the rabbi said, I should come see you. The rabbi said, you come? Why? He says, well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm marrying off uh, my daughter. I married off two kids last year. Things are very tight. I need $20,000 to make the wedding. You know, I'm a little bit short. He told me you're a rich guy. You can help me. The guy said, the rabbi said, I'm rich. I, 
I'm barely keeping it together for my own family. He says, the rabbi told me to... They go back to the rabbi. He goes, rabbi, you told him to come to me? Because I don't have any money. I'm not a rich guy. He goes, oh, you're not rich? Oh, I'm so sorry. I must have made a mistake. He says, I'm, I apologize. I got it. I got it wrong. I'll figure out how to help that. Helps the guy. Guy leaves. Two minutes later, the guy sees... Dave sees the door of the rabbi study open. A guy's looking at him from across the room. He tells the guy, stay there. I'm coming to you. He walks to the rabbi's office. He says, he says, what am I supposed to help you with? He says, the guy, he says, outside, he says, my car, unfortunately, has a flat. You know, uh, there's only two of us outside. We need to lift the car up on the curb. The rabbi told me you're unbelievably, you're a very strong guy. You lift weights in the gym every day. You could deadlift 500 pounds. The guy says, 500 pounds between my bad back and my creaky bones and my lack of workout. Bizarre, I could lift my briefcase. He goes to the rabbi. Rabbi, you told him I'm a strong, not a strong guy. Two minutes later, again, again, the scene repeats itself, repeats. Finally, the rabbi says, Dave, come. He says, you're not a finance guy. You're not a rich guy. You're not a strong guy. You're not a creative guy. You're not a spiritual guy. You don't know Torah. What are you arrogant about? The guy's like, Hazal Baruch, Rabbi. <laughs> I read this story. And I want to share with you. I want you to imagine an alternate scenario. Where Dave comes to the rabbi and doesn't tell him, I have a problem with my ego and my arrogance. He tells the rabbi, Rabbi, I don't know anything about finances. I don't know anything about this. I don't know anything about that. I don't know rich. I'm not handsome. I'm not this. I'm not creative. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I'm a nobody. I'm a nothing. I'm a worthless. I'm good for on and on. What's the rabbi going to tell him? Huh? Did it know? What's the rabbi going to tell him? What are you talking about? You have this Brahmana, and you have this thing, and you're good at this, and you're good at something else. What would the rabbi tell Dave if his problem was not arrogance? His problem was that he was too humble. The rabbi would build him up. My friends, forget the rabbi now. Let's talk to Dave like he's each and every one of us. To a person that has an ego, what do you tell the person? What don't you have? What aren't you? What could you still do to build yourself up? To a person who feels inadequate, what do you tell the person? How special are you? What do you have? How good are you? This is not just about ego and about inadequacy. It's about a person who's happy with life. It's about a person who is, on the one hand, might be unsatisfied. On the other hand, might be complacent. So we must have in our life the ability to have a split personality. We have to tell ourselves on the good days, we have to give ourselves the musar, which is humbling. And on the bad days, we have to give ourselves the chizuk, which builds us up. My friends, that ability to find balance in your own self-talk, to constantly fight the other side, to always be the devil's advocate, whatever the dominant, the prominent voice in your head is saying, to be able to combat that by bringing it the other side of the equation, that's how a person is successful in their life. Again, my friends, that's how a person is successful in their lives. And I want to share another example of this idea. Because I believe that it is part of the problem that people find in the way they motivate themselves to do better and to be better. The Chachamim give a mashal, an example. And we've mentioned the example before. Chachamim give an example of a person who's on a ladder. The person has on the ladder people who are above him on the ladder. And the person has on the ladder people that are below him climbing the ladder. A person could look up and see people above him and think there's more to achieve. Or a person could look below and see people so far below him that he could decide, you know what, I've climbed it up. 
I'm the head of so many people. How does one decide when to look up and when to look down? Say how Chachamim, that the Pasuk says, Ala shamay mimal v'ala aretz mitahat. Ala shamayim, when it comes to matters of the spirit, mimal, always look at the people that are above you. That asks you to be able to strive higher, to do more, to achieve greater things. But ala aretz, when it comes to matters, of the physical, al ha'aretz mitahat. When it comes to matters of the physical, a person can sustain themselves by looking at what they have versus what other people don't. This ability to understand why God gave you two eyes. He gave you an eye to be able to see ayin tov and ayin ra. And my friends, I always wondered, how could it be that God gave you one good eye and one bad eye? Could it be that God gave you something bad? Is that possible? Is it possible that God could give you something that is inherently negative? It's impossible. So what does it mean that God gave a person an ayin tov and an ayin ra? And the answer is that there's an ayin ra which is also good. There's a stinginess. There's a criticism. There's a negativity which also has its place. The problem is that we use our ayin ra to be jealous of someone. We use our ayin ra to be critical of someone when we could be using the ayin ra to find areas in ourselves that are not what they should be. Deciding how to use each one of your enai is the great job of a person in this world. How and when? to see with an ayin tov and what to see with an ayin ra. A lot of times you have a friend, a family member, they're coming to you for advice. And you know what? When they're ready to risk it all and they're too risky in their outlook, what do you do? You ground them. You hedge their bets. You talk to them about the, the reasons why they should not take that step. And if they're hesitating to take that step and they're coming to you, what does a good person who's giving good advice do? They encourage the person. And let me explain why this conundrum works. The dominant voice, the obvious voice in a person's mind, in their spirit, oftentimes is the voice, is the perspective, which is not nuanced. The loudest voice, right, is not the finest voice. So when you're trying to listen to the most delicate of harmonies, the idea is not turning the volume to the max. Max volume music is not nuanced or complicated music. So the things you're hearing the loudest oftentimes are an underdeveloped idea or perspective that you have. That loud voice is the voice that the person is leaning towards most often. So when you come to someone and they're so sure of something, you can give them a gift. I call it the two-word gift. The gift of maybe not. You're so sure? Here, maybe not. Let's see the other side. Now, it could be at the end of the maybe not that you come out with a clearer perspective and you still go down that path. But maybe not. Maybe not keeps you honest. Maybe not keeps you sure. And you are maybe not, it's not defeatist. It's not telling that you can't. It's just asking the pertinent, the relevant questions that we need to ask. My friends, I think perhaps this is one of the reasons why in the Pasuk that opens our parasha, which always comes before Rosh Hashanah, we say, Ha'azinu ha'shamayim v'adabera v'tishma ha'aretz there's a listening that comes along with shamayim, the highest heavens, the things that propel a person to move forward. There's also, on the other hand, a tishma ha'aretz imrefi, a listening that the grounding force needs to do. Each side of our balanced thought process needs to listen carefully to its own narrative to be able to discern 
whether or not that advice is good advice. And I want to share with you an example of this concept. There's a fellow, his name is Rabbi Yitzchak Names. I might be pronouncing his names wrong, his name wrong, his name might be names, his name might be Numis, his name might be the Moose. I don't know. I don't have Nikudot. I just read it in Hebrew. Okay? But Nun Mev. <laughs> that smile from Mario is worth everything. All right? My friends, this rabbi. We'll call him Rabbi Yitzchak for sure. This rabbi, Rabbi Yitzchak, was a person who loved Jews and he loved helping Jews do mitzvot. Anyway, one day he bumps into this fellow. His name is Tenko, which is an old Yiddish name. Okay? Anyway, the guy is Jewish, but he's living out in the boondocks. He's not religious, doesn't really have much of a kesher with his Judaism, and he meets this guy. He's an older person. And the rabbi says to him, you know, what can I send you? What can I do for you? He eat kosher. Guy says, nah, rabbi, thank you. There's no kosher where I live. He says, I have a great idea. He says, you have an oven at home? He says, yeah. He goes, why don't I do this? I'll buy you kosher food. Frozen food. I'll send it to you. There's somebody called Ba'i's Kitchen. Big uh, Ba'alat Chesed. She does unbelievable chesed with people that need help, uh, who can't make the holidays. But she also uh, is a premier provider holiday food to, you know, to a lot of people in the Jewish people, especially on Passover, etc. Et she sends you, everything is frozen, labeled, marked. This guy goes to a place like that and decides he's going to buy. Every week, he's going to buy a week's worth of frozen food. He's going to drive it all the way to the sky in the boondocks. The guy will fill up his freezer with a week's worth of, week's worth of food in the freezer. And then every day, he'll be able to heat up one of the kosher meals. Our fellow Rav Yitzchak is not a fool. He knows that he doesn't need to drive all the way there. He could just buy the guy a month's worth of frozen food. The problem is that he only has enough money to pay for seven meals at a time. So every time he gets enough money, he buys a week's worth of meals. He drives it out to the sky, fills up the freezer. Every time he comes, all the food's gone. He feels wonderful that he's giving this fellow kosher food and he's saving him from eating tarif. Anyway, long time goes by. He walks into the thing and uh, and he walks into the guy's house and he fills up the freezer one more time and he says, you know, tell me, Tenkel. He says, you're enjoying the food. Does it need more salt? Does it need more pepper? How does it, you know, Tenkel says, I don't know. I have no idea. And all of a sudden, he caught himself. And he's like, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, Rabbi said, what do you mean? And Tankle says, look, Rabbi, I feel bad lying to you. He said, all this time, I've been heating the meals up and feeding it to my dog. Like he's sending me the food. I'm a simple guy. I have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. You know, all this, I mean, it's very nice, but I, I'm sorry. I was feeding it to my dog. I, I don't want to lie to you. Rabbi comes home. Devastated. He's driving all this way. Paying all this money. And the only pasuk in the Torah that he's fulfilling is la kelev tashlit gunoto. Feels horrible. Anyway, his wife says, listen, you know, it's not your job to finish the mitzvah. It's your job to do the mitzvah. What happens after you've done your part? That's up to Hashem. No way you could have known that. Shamayim, God, will consider it as if you gave a Jew kosher food because that was your intention. That was the mitzvah that you tried to carry out that you put the effort into. Hey, the guy's bothered. He's very upset. He feels terrible about it. Anyway, all right. Moving on. Years go by. Years and years and years. In one Shabbat afternoon, one, excuse me, one end of Shabbat, Mrs. Nemus, names Nemes, Nemeth, gets a phone call. And on the phone is an outreach organization. 
They tell, listen, you know, we have a bunch of uh, young people. They're coming uh, to the town for Shabbat. We're hosting different people by everybody's house. And um, and we need places for people to stay, for people to eat. You know, we have a young Russian boy, um, maybe 18, 19 years old. We'd love, would you be able to host him for the Shabbaton? She says, of course. Send them to me. You know, no problem. His address. Kid comes over Friday afternoon. She walks over to the guy. She says, listen, it's Friday afternoon. There's a thing to taste the Shabbat food on Friday. She says, would you like some kugel? Would you like some this? Would you like some that? And the boy says, listen, lady, I'm here on the Shabbaton. I'm curious what's what's going on over here. He says, I- I'm a little bit, uh, you know, curious. I want to see what this is. But you're treating me so nicely. You know, I can tell you want you want something from me. You may as well give up. I'm not becoming religious. The guy knows, eat enough kugel, you become religious. That's how it works. My friends, the woman says, listen, you know, I, I, I don't mind if you don't eat it. It's no problem. Whatever. Leave it. You know, you don't want to eat it, no problem. Just take it easy, relax, go to your room. If you want something else, let me know. I'm not shoving anything on you. There's no expectations. What's your name? The boy says his name is Tenko. She says, Tenko, that's such an interesting name. I've only known one other Tenko before. She says, really? She says, yeah, years and years and years ago, my husband used to drive to the middle of nowhere and then some and drop off. And the boy finishes the sentence. Kosher food. For a man called Tenko. She says, yeah. How do you know? He says, how do I know? How do you know? She says, well, I told you. My husband used to drive every week. Till she found out. Till he found out that he was feeding it to the dog. The boy smiles. He goes, yeah, my, my grandpa told me that story. So the woman says, I can't believe your grandson. He says, she says, why are you here? She says, well. He says, well, when my grandpa told me that story. I said to myself, what are these religious people about? What is this religion about? That someone could save up their money, buy meals, drive it three hours to fill up someone's fridge, not to get any money, not to have anything from them, only that the person should eat kosher. I saw a flyer that said, would you like to learn more about Judaism? They were doing the Shabbaton. So I decided, you know what? I'll go on the Shabbaton. I'll learn about what makes these people tick. Why would this guy deliver food to my grandpa all that years, all those years ago to get nothing from it? What motivates them? What brings them that kindness? Who teaches them that self-sacrifice? And I wanted to see it for myself up close. I cannot believe that I wound up in the house of the people who caused me to come on this journey in the first place. You can imagine that Tenko ate the kugel, drank the Kool-Aid, and now Tenko is the assistant rabbi of this syndrome joke. Holy like, holy cow! Rabbi Mizrahi! My friends, the Yetzirah's greatest gift is that in between those two conversations that you have with yourself, do more. You're doing too much. No, come on, you're so arrogant. You're not arrogant. You're not forward enough. The Yetzirah gets that voice in there that tells you what you're doing is not worth it. What you're doing is not important. What you're doing doesn't matter. You know what? He fed it to the dog. You know, you think you're so kind? That people are horrible. They're just taking advantage. She's a liar. They don't really need the money. These guys all sketch. But Akadosh Baruch Hu doesn't work that way. God is Yire la Levav. He sees your heart. He knows how you're trying. But my friends, because God sees your heart, you know what else? He also knows when you're not trying hard enough. There's a fat guy whose wife bought him a Fitbit. 
every day she's yelling at him. How come he didn't take steps? How come he didn't take steps? How come he didn't take steps? One day, she goes to Majnun. She comes home. He has a beautiful meal. She set, set the table. Romantic music, candlelight. He goes, he goes, oh, this is so beautiful. She says, well, I'm really proud of you. I saw how many steps you took today. And the guy starts laughing like a behemoth. Like the behemoth that he is. She says, what's so funny? It's good. You took all those steps to be healthy. He says, I put the Fitbit on the dog when I gave it to the dog walker. Behemoth. The problem is when God doesn't need a Fitbit to see your heart because Ha'elohim Yir'elalebav God knows if you didn't do enough. God knows if there's more in the tank. God knows if you tried your hardest. So it doesn't matter what people think. It doesn't matter what winds up happening. It just The only thing that matters is am I doing my all to be able to do the very best that I can. Where I use my voice to be able to hedge my bets one way, hedge my bets the other way, until I'm finding my way down this golden path. Where I don't listen to the Yetzirah when he tells me to do too much. And I don't listen to the Yetzirah when he tells me to do too little. I adjust accordingly. Hashem should bless us always to have this balance in our life to live our very best selves. Baruch Amen.